Yeah, I mean, it isn't big enough to have people afford to work on it. That's probably the biggest lie of open source is the bigger something is, the, the more money is rolling into it. With OpenFAS, there's very little external funding at all. Even community contributions, as lovely as they are, there aren't people with full-time jobs sat there on, on their CV. It says full-time open vast contributor. That just isn't the case with something like this. Now, there are companies that are big and small that use open vast in production, but only two out of all of them sponsor the project. So it's very difficult. And I think just like what you said there goes to show how much of a problem this is that many people assume project that's widely used or that's grown to a certain size must be well-funded and have a great future ahead of it. Hello and welcome to Committing to Cloud Native, the podcast where we talk about the confluence of cloud native technology and open source. I am one of your hosts today, Richard Littauer. Our other host is Justin Dorfman. Justin, how are you doing? Doing great. How are you, Richard? Doing excellent. Super excited to be here and talking to our guest. Today, we have Alex Ellis on. Alex is the founder of OpenFAS, that's Open F-A-A-S. He's calling in today from Peterborough, which is somewhere in lovely England. Alex, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. It's September, end of September. The weather is starting to get a bit cooler. We're seeing autumn leaves falling and a bit of a change in the air. It's beautiful where I am. I'm on the main coast and I'm so happy. It's just clear and cool and lovely. Did I pronounce open fast correctly? You did say it how I say it. It was open fast. Can you describe what it is? Yes, open fast project that I originally created as a kind of uh, proof of concept in 2016. And what I'd seen was this idea of serverless and functions as a service and I'd seen it on Amazon's um, cloud, but the interface didn't really match what I was expecting. I worked in an enterprise at a payroll company. I was used to continuous delivery. I was used to being able to use Git or source control to upload stuff. And it looked very different. You know, you had the zip files or S3 buckets to deal with, very tight constraints on timeouts. And some of these things have changed since. It just didn't really fit what I wanted. And I was also very much into Docker. So containers, immutable infrastructure, and all of that kind of stuff. And so I want to kind of find a way to have that same experience on my own hardware, either at work, or on my Raspberry Pi, or on a server under my desk. Excellent. Now, OpenFast isn't a small thing anymore, right? It's one of the most popular open source serverless projects. Can you talk to me about how adoption has gone and how many people have used it or committed to it? Yeah, in terms of committers, people that have created a patch and actually had it merged, I don't keep track of the number anymore, but it's over 300. And if people are interested, there's a, a function that was written by someone in the community that calculates it, displays it on a pretty leaderboard. So I remember when somebody joined recently, well, say recently, 18 months ago, he was excited that he quickly got himself up to sort of the top 10 of all time committers. So that's something that's really fun about OpenFAS for me is being, I guess, part of something that's bigger than myself, having a vision for it, being able to make connections and relationships with people that are contributing or interested in it. Some of those people are my friends. Some of those people are around just for a very short season and then we sort of don't hear from them again. But collectively building OpenFAS, a serverless platform that's cloud agnostic, that's cloud native all the way down that integrates into other CNCF projects like Prometheus and Nats. and just gives you a really portable way to run functions on your own terms. Anything you can put in a Docker file can run on OpenFast. So it's actually really useful for microservices as well. I love that. And I love the fact that the community is really essential to it. Now, you're really eloquent when talking about it, not just because it's your project initially and you were the person who started it, but also because it's, it's larger than you. And you are now one of the people who helps build the community. So one of the questions I have when talking about this is, how do you fund the project? I mean, is there a business model involved? What does that look like for OpenFast? How has it grown from just being a little project that you're tinkering on to a much larger community-based project that is big enough to actually afford to have people work on it? Yeah, I mean, it isn't big enough to have people afford to work on it. That's probably the biggest lie of open source is the bigger something is that the more money is rolling into it. With OpenFAS, there's very little external funding at all. 
even community contributions, as lovely as they are, there aren't people with full-time jobs sat there on, on their CV. It says full-time open fast contributor. That just isn't the case with something like this. Now, there are companies that are big and small that use open fast in production, but only two out of all of them sponsor the project. So it's very difficult. And I think just like what you said there goes to show how much of a problem this is that many people assume project that's widely used or that's grown to a certain size must be well-funded and have a great future ahead of it. There's a really interesting piece of writing that I read recently. I'll look it up so we can add it in the show notes, but it basically says something like open source isn't about you. And I thought as a maintainer, it, it really rang true. Is that open source at the core of it is a license defined by this OSI standards body that sort of sets out some usage of the code. And that's where it ends. You know, there's no governance, there's no rights to support, or you can't sort of shout at a maintainer or get them to do what you want, join their community. There's nothing is a given. So everything is done on goodwill. And I find that when you look at who's capturing the value from an open source project or community, the balance is, is really skewed. I mentioned those companies, some of them are billion dollar companies that don't contribute code, bug reports, don't even pay a dollar towards its success. Now, they're getting a huge amount of value from that. Right? They're capturing a lot of value. The community, from their use, perhaps not capturing too much value, but the creators, nothing at all. If anything, it's, an, it's a negative, right? What would be ideal is if there was a balance and what in marketing framework you'll read is that a sustainable business has value exchange or value capture that is equal between all three parties, the consumers of it, the company or the creator behind it, and the community of partners, contributors, and, and sort of third parties. Question I had was a few years ago, Kelsey Hightower did a keynote on the benefits of Amazon's Lambda at KubeCon. Some say that it was very brave of him since it was just a bunch of people that are very committed to Kubernetes and kind of doing it themselves. How did that or just other presentations in the community have a, an effect on OpenFast to just become a project of its size now? I think what has led to it get to the size it is, is primarily my sort of incessant urge and need to solve this problem from initially for myself and then to support that for other people. As I said, there's over 300 committers. There's almost 4,000 different individuals in the Slack community. It's 28 plus thousand GitHub stars on the project. It fills a need that Lambda doesn't. And even customers that are on Amazon Lambda may use OpenFAS on Amazon's EKS service, or maybe they've spun up their own Kubernetes cluster there. So some, it's not necessarily anti-Lambda or anything like that. Or I actually think that managed cloud functions are a really smart idea. They're great to use. Uh, the cost cannot be beat in any way. But when you need a bit more flexibility or you need to do something outside of their main scope, there's just not a lot of options for you. And so I did probably the biggest speaking tour I've done in my life from 2016, late 2016 till to the beginning of the pandemic that we've had. I was probably away from home every month doing a different conference talk wow. or talking at a meetup or something like that. And so just seeding it with that amount of energy and time made a big difference to it. But also, as I say, solving a problem and some of what I've learned since going independent and having to support myself and open faz from my own steam is that for something to succeed, it needs to solve a problem. And also it needs to be clear what the alternatives are and what it does differently. A lot of yeah. people might get into writing an ebook or they might get into releasing some commercial add-ons for their software. They kind of create something that's called a commodity, right? Commodity is, I don't know, Let's say we were looking at computer screens, right? We're working from home. We thought, right, I want a 27 inch. There's a Dell one that's 400 pounds. And then there's an Apple that's 8,000, right? When you compare the two, you could say, okay, well, that 
is that an oranges to oranges comparison? No pun intended. Probably not, because Apple has this premium brand where the same product can be basically costing 10, 100 times more money and do very similar things. But if there was a comparison between a Dell and a BenQ, and the BenQ is 50 pounds cheaper, probably most developers would buy that. Right? So we're looking at commodities, things that can be compared easily on price and features. When it comes to something like an information product you might create or a professional add-on for some software or even an open source project, you also have to bear that in mind. What you don't want to create, which is something that I've really learned, is a commodity. And further than that, you don't want to create something where there's no capability for you to capture value from it, right? Because as, as great as it feels to give all of that value away, if there's no hooks and no reason for a company to pay you money, it's just not going to work out, right? Because it's working for free. And that's really the struggle that I've had since the very beginning of the project. Yeah. I think one thing that's crazy because you, you know, you're a CNCF ambassador and you just figure, oh, OpenFast is totally in the, the CNCF, at least as an incubation project, but it's not. How do people react to that? that folks that want to use OpenFast in their organization? Honestly, it's never been an issue. Uh, oh. I haven't had anybody complain about that. Now, one thing that did happen is that OpenFast, as I said, started off as my own project in my own GitHub repo, and it was just called FAS. That was in, I think it had a big bump when I took it to DockerCon and presented on the main stage. And then a guy from VMware came and spoke to me. He'd been using OpenWhisk with his team and they'd been spending a couple of weeks hitting their head against the wall. And he said to them, well, why don't you take a look at Alex's project? Within a couple of hours, they had it fully implemented exactly how they wanted it. Whoa. And then I remember about three months later, meeting that same guy at another DockerCon. And I'd since moved the project repo FAS into its own organization called Open FAS. And he came up to me and said, that was a very smart move. That really helped us. And so I think what people are looking for is a degree of independence. Is they want something that looks like it's being created by a company or looks like it's being managed in an independent way, rather than something that looks like it's like being created by someone in their bedroom. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you go to the website, it's like really pro. It's just looks like it's going to be something that is going to be there for a while. You bring up independence. And I know that's like one thing that I see a pattern in, whether it's on your website and Twitter, talk to me about independence and how important it is to you and fast and open fast and all the other projects that you work on and books. Yeah. I mean, for me, what I mean by independence is that not being employed by a, any one company. And I think that goes back to, I remember as I was part of the Docker Captains group in Docker's heyday, there were a number of consultants that were earning an incredible amount of money, much more than I was, at least three or four times more. And it wasn't just that, but they didn't really belong at one company. They wouldn't be able to get the best, or the community wouldn't be able to get the best out of them that way. I think of people like Nigel Poulton, a trainer, he's still independent now. Brett Fisher, who's doing extremely well with his different Udemy courses and various other people like that who stepped out of the security of full-time employment to serve their communities better and to pursue their own business ideas. Now, for me, it wasn't really that I woke up one day and thought, you know what, I'd rather have no financial security and work full-time on something that's giving me no income. It was actually, I had taken up an opportunity at VMware they were paying me a very generous salary. We had a full-time team there. And then things changed in the industry and they decided to back a different project and they ran down the team. At which point, really, I had a look around to see if I could get a similar arrangement that had created some uncertainty in the industry. And the only way I could get the job that I wanted was by creating it myself. The job of working on OpenFAS, the predominant amount of my time, continuing to support the end users, continuing to build a shepherd that community to grow it, set a vision for it, expand it, could only really be done in that way. So that is what I did in 2019. I think it was March. I just set out on that journey and it took me three months to get the first invoice. I was learning a huge amount about setting up a company, running it in the UK, what's involved. 
there are various books that I read, some of them a bit too late, like Million Dollar Consulting by Alan Weiss. And that one talks all about value-based projects. And I wish I'd known that from the start because I remember doing some hourly rate stuff for a client, writing them some technical content and they were getting way more value and still getting people visiting that content today than I was being paid for it. And when you're effectively bringing in your own money, working per the hour, it just doesn't scale. It doesn't work. So if you think of somebody at AWS, principal developer, their total compensation is going to be between $300,000 to $500,000 minimum, right? Within that range for our sort of skill level. If you're right. working on your own and you're billing per the hour, whatever it is, it's never going to be high enough to get anywhere near that sort of value. And so that's what it means for me being independent is I decide what I'm going to work on. Yes, I may have some clients and requirements and um, things that we're working on together, but ultimately I can hire and find my own clients. I can decide what I'm going to do that day. And some people have actually said that they want to earn those sorts of monies at Amazon. And you might sort of ask them why it could be for prestige. It could just be because they feel like they deserve that. Or it might be because they'll say, well, if I had more money, then I could retire early. Then I'd have more discretionary time. Well, if we're working more and harder and having less say in, in what we're doing in our lives in order to get more money, in order to have more discretionary time, being independent is one way you can get that discretionary time now. What you're saying to me makes a huge amount of sense. I also went independent a while ago. It's helped me a lot. And I also have been recommended books by Alan Weiss and have them on my shelf because of this sort of thinking. I can't stress enough how pretty much everything you're saying just really resonates with how I see open source and how I see working in this industry. One of the benefits for me has been being able to actually work with multiple clients in open source so that I'm not just stuck looking at one solution and one problem. By having multiple different projects, I actually tend to be a better developer and a better community manager in the long run. Looking at your work and looking at OpenFAS and what you've done there, I'm really interested in the idea that to have a sustainable open source project, you have to have someone who's in charge of it or someone who is high up in the governance scheme who's able to actually support themselves by having an independent workload, by having an independent pay, by doing all the work that you're doing. It just seems like it really helps out the community at large to have someone be able to know this knowledge and actually go out and sell themselves and the project at the same time. Do you think that's accurate? Do you think it's an accurate assessment of how to build a sustainable open source community? Not, I'm curious. not necessarily. Cool. I think it's the de facto that I fell into. If you look at certain projects, when I was at VMware, there was the founder of I think it was called Go Swagger. He either created it there at VMware and then he was given a position full time to work on it. You had Open vSwitch, part of Oven, and the guy that created that had a team and working on it full time there. There was Network Service Mesh, it was an initiative they helped to co create and had a full time team working on it. So you have this model where Red Hat staffs an entire team just to contribute to one project in the ecosystem. Obviously, Kubernetes is the key one there. There's teams at every big cloud provider that just work on upstream Kubernetes. That's all they do. Like you said earlier, to get those votes, to get that governance, to get that footprint, to be able to take that to customer meetings and say, well, look, this is what we do for it. So there is that model as well. That model is one that I tried. It is useful for both parties as long as it's useful for both parties. And at some point it differs. When I was at VMware, they really wanted me to go to as many speaking events as possible. Did that serve the project? Probably not. It's very tiring to go to a different event every month and to feel that that is one of your objectives because it certainly did benefit the project, but probably I could have done with just going to the key cube cons and, and Docker cons and be done with it. Now, fortunately or unfortunately with the pandemic, I've not been to any events for about two years. So I've been completely focused, but, you know, I think that is one of the things it's like when a venture backed company gets its investors or another set of board members is whatever they care about growth or an arbitrary metric that becomes a thing that you have to care about and drive. 
So it also requires me to be very reflective about what I do in order to know what is it that I should be doing. There are books like Start With Why for Simon Sinek. It's quite a long book, but it can be summed up in a very short way by saying, why am I doing this? What purpose is it serving? And sometimes something that you start, the the purpose it served for you at the beginning may not exist anymore. And being independent, you have the ability to cut things free. One of those things was there was a cloud add-on for OpenVAS for basically an enterprise company to have a Heroku-like experience around OpenVAS. Very big, very complex, but really lovely to use. You would commit some code into a GitHub repo, and in a few seconds, you'd have a working endpoint for it, including secrets management, multi-user, dashboard, et cetera. But again, like I said, there's some books that I've learned from that I wish that I had back then. One of them is The Right It by Alberto Savioa, head of innovation at Google. Now, the idea of The Right It is that you should always be solving some sort of pain, but more than that, you should pre-prototype that with something that maybe takes an hour, two hours, a day, a week at most, and no more than that. Let's say that I wanted to take OpenFAS and the pro add-ons that I've created. Let's say that there's potentially 100 or 500, maybe 1,000 individuals like you and me who want to use OpenFAS Pro at home, obviously aren't going to pay the amount a company would. So what would I do? Well, I'd create some kind of pre-prototype. It might be a survey form. It might be something where people have to pre-register and actually pay the first installment. I, I don't know, but that's the idea. And with a lot of what I've done, I haven't driven it that way. I've created something that solved a problem for me, scratched a personal itch. And some of the time it just happened to have a broader interest. And then you invest more time in it invite a community, seed it. And it could be a wild success, could be a moderate success. And that's maybe just luck or my ability to promote and and create ecosystems. Now I'm much more reluctant to create something new and I'd rather apply Alberto's techniques, especially when it comes to business and market fit. So you're also known for creating other projects, which seem to go against the idea of just doing a small little tiny thing and seeing if it works. Can you talk about why you go out and create other projects as well? Yeah. So with a lot of what I've done, I've just found something that I'm not happy with uh, or not satisfied with. And I don't think I'm the only one. I don't know if you use WhatsApp, or one of the alternatives to that, but all of my family use WhatsApp now and expect me to use it as well. Probably a few years prior to that, it was SMS. And now I even get emails from my wife. If I'm in the shed doing some woodworking, are you coming in to watch TV with me? And so communication has changed because it just wasn't quite right. There was always a better way of doing things. We're recording this on Zoom. Prior to that, we had Skype, you know, which has sort of fallen out of favor a little bit. I created inlets over a seasonal holiday and I was leading a team and we needed webhooks to test OpenFast Cloud, that project that we deprecated eventually. How could we get webhooks? Well, we were behind a a corporate VPN and a corporate proxy and SSH tunnels were blocked. That's really running out of all options. Even NGROC was blocked as most of the time it is on a corporate network. And I was just thinking about web sockets and long running connections and what I'd done with OpenFast. And I started tinkering And I wrote a bit of Go code that serialized HTTP requests over a WebSocket tunnel. It was a basic proxy. I love writing that sort of thing. And it actually worked. What I was able to do was create a very cheap virtual machine for $5 on DigitalOcean, run my server code there, run the client on my laptop. And then I had OpenFAS, the Prometheus dashboard, and Grafana all exposed on the internet. Why did I create it? Well, I had a situation where the current software just wouldn't work. And we needed a solution. I love tinkering and I love sort of trying to create technical solutions around this stuff. So I created Inlets. It started, I got some feedback on it. And the more feedback I got on the use of it, GitHub stars, et cetera, the more time I invested into it alongside OpenFAS. 
now in Let's is no longer an open source project. It's commercial, but it has a number of open source add-ons around it that orchestrate it, create those servers, Helm charts, documentation, and get a lot of contributions to them with dozens of developers. So with each of them, there's always sort of a why. Ketchup or K3S up is this installer for K3S that works over SSH. Why do they create that? Well, with some of the earliest clients I was working with, their audience wasn't really at the stage where they were ready for full-on Kubernetes. But K3S was nascent. It was stirring a lot of hearts and people really liked the idea of simplicity, Kubernetes. But to install K3S, you had to log on the machine, install your SSH key, then run a, a installer script or download the binary and run it, move it to the right location. Once it was running, the cube config file on the machine had the wrong permissions for you to use it. So you'd had to ch mod it, copy it to the right place, all of this stuff. And then when you wanted to join another machine, you had to log into there, log back into your server, download the join token for the cluster, copy and paste it across. And all of this stuff was really cumbersome. And I remembered what I liked about Docker Swarm, which was Docker Swarm in it, Docker Swarm join. And so with Ketchup, I was able to deduplicate all these tutorials I was writing, paid content for clients, just to be Ketchup install. Right now we have K3S, now we have Kubernetes, let's get on with things. Same happened with the join command. And then because that happens to work well on Raspberry Pi, because I know quite a bit about multi-arch, I've been working with that for a while. Everything I created just happened to work on that. And so that opened a new audience. The other big project, uh, I guess, or bigger project that's growing is Arcade. Arcade used to be part of Ketchup. And for exactly the same reason, I'd write a piece of content for a client, 5,000 words for setting up basic Kubernetes cluster with a secure registry on it. I mean, it's ridiculous. With this new Arcade program, I was able to condense that down to five commands, basically by saying, right, I want Ingress Nginx, I want Cert Manager, I want Docker Open Source Registry, I want a certificate for it now. Rather than having to do all of the legwork of explaining every part, going through every tutorial, reading a values.yaml file, worrying about GitOps just for your laptop, it meant that you could do things much, much quicker. I love the way how you approach things. You seem to be very, very good at finding out, okay, what do I want to do? And then just doing it, particularly with all the cloud native stuff that you're mentioning. I would not have been able to think of those solutions. So amazing. One of the questions I have now is that you have GitHub sponsors and you have various OSS projects. You talk about how you keep people engaged with all the work that you do. One of the things that I do, and I don't know if it keeps people engaged or if it works the other way. So I'm quite active on Twitter. I might have a bit of a problem there. I can say you're very active and I love every tweet you do. So please give yourself a little credit there. <laughs> oh, thank you. But I do think about some folks like Daniel Vasalo, who was an AWS senior employee. He quit, went independent, started selling books. He created a course on how to create Twitter following. It's all right. But the basic ideas are that be very careful about your tweet about build the brand, talk to people, don't spam, don't always ask for things. You've got to build credit in order to ask for things. And I think with open source, there is that principle of goodwill. And it's a bit like a bank account. Someone arrives on Slack, as they did today, I won't name names, directly DMs me and I have no idea who the person is and makes a request of me to give them deep technical support. Probably not going to happen. If, however, Somebody that's contributed over the last few months who I actually know, who maybe has come to a contributors call or I've met at a conference, ask me the same thing. It's much likely that there'll be a different result there. Not because of any particular reason, but I think knowing people, working your way into a community, building up goodwill is a, is a smart way to go about that. So I have many personal connections with people. I like to communicate with them, but it's difficult to keep people appraised. Now, one thing that I did used to do a lot is write a blog post every weekend. I'd go out with my wife for coffee. She'd read her book. I'd write a blog post, see if I could, you know, do it in a couple of hours before we left and, and went home for dinner. I don't really do as much of that now. I still write blog posts, but they tend to be more around open fares where I want a particular result. So there's a new feature I want to talk about. Or it's a guest post. 
about inlets because I'm trying to sort of hit another SEO term or I'm trying to explain a new feature like all well, the metrics and monitoring that I've added recently. Maybe it's an end user case study. So I'm much more focused on that business aspect of it now and what's in it for me as much as what's in it for you. Whereas it used to all be about what's in it for you. So what I've done is I set up a GitHub sponsors account. It's varied. It's gone up and down. Sometimes it goes down more than up, which is obviously disappointing. But one thing that I committed to in 2019 was to write an email to them every week. It's a bit like a weekly report. Like you guys might have to write to your boss on a Friday afternoon or Monday morning, like I want your weekly report. And what I learned in the industry was you really want to focus on the impact that you've had rather than on the detail. So sometimes I'll write about a little feature, how practice makes perfect, or at least better is what I talked about in the last week's edition. I've talked about how to influence maintainers and make pull requests. I've talked about software pricing. I've talked about a lot of my own personal journey, but then I'll give a summary of the changes and updates and events and live streams coming up on all of those projects. If there's something that I guess that I think is cool about one of the projects that the community has done, I'll include that in there as well. So guest blogs. So that's how I keep in touch. Now people get them every week and if they pay a certain amount, they can get into the treasure trove where they've got discounts for all of my eBooks and they can find like over 107 of these updates. 23 hours ago, you got something from GitHub. What is it? Oh, the box? Yeah. Yeah, I actually was using that this morning. They sent me an ember cup, a warmed, like it's a cup that's an IoT cup, keeps your coffee warm. Some headphones, a light, a stream deck. Basically, a few, I guess a few months ago, they invited me to join their GitHub Stars program, which mm, is a, an influencer nice. insider program. It's all very confidential, but it's their way of sort of building an influencer program with people that are very active on the platform, getting some feedback. And it was just a, a sweet thing that they did. They also sent me a, I think it's bronze, 3D printed model of all of my GitHub commits. If you look at my Twitter You account, have many of those. Well, there's many more because I automated something to upload pictures of my plants to a GitHub repo. Ah, I got it. And it <laughs> went to a crazy number. <laughs> But it was really high before that. I mean, it was thousands before that. No, it's uh, well-deserved. GitHub definitely knows how to appreciate their community and all the things that you, what Daniel Stenberg has done with Curl and so many others. Just really great work. I'm very grateful for the gift. It's very kind of them to do that. Now, in return for these sort of weekly emails, for these insights into my life, and actually I've had people email me and say, it's, it's inspirational. And it might not be that I'm doing anything particular that week. Someone just said, I like the fact that actually, if I quit my job, I might be okay because you are, right? Mm. And you've got this wealth of information that you've told us basically the playbook. You told us the right books to go and buy and read. And we feel like we would do okay. You can do more than okay. You can do exceptionally well and even earn more than a full-time job. The problem is... And this is why the GitHub sponsors and getting end users to sponsor or pay for support is important for open fans. Is do you want that? Do you want me, the maintainer, the perhaps the lead architect of this software, to be spending the predominant amount of my time consulting and getting paid for that? It doesn't make business sense to be stingy there because if you want to have a better product and project, if you want this to be around for longer, if you want it to be more relevant, if you want it to be getting mentioned in podcasts and want me to be flying to conferences, you need to invest into it. And by not sponsoring it or by not buying the commercial add-ons, companies are actually doing themselves a disservice because then I'm having to make up more of my time. Well, actually, I love it. I'm not complaining, but it means that I can't do the open source and I can't balance that. I can't build this community. I can't coach as many people on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah, I agree. Especially sponsorships over donations because of that recurring monthly revenue. It just has more of a, a security factor to it in terms of financial security. So it's great to see that. The, I mean, you do if, you were to look at, if you were to look at my accounts, right, if we'll crack them open now, you see that 
probably 90% of the revenue is from me doing what I do best, but for other companies. So the way that I created these open source projects, got the GitHub stars up, wrote about them, talked about them, promoted them, distributed them with key industry contacts, had them in weekly newsletters, et cetera, got the feedback and acted on it. All of those things, companies are approaching me. Equinix Metal is one of our clients, other ones to speak of as well. And Data Stacks is another one that's just come on board recently. Doing what I've done and do best, but for them, not as an employee, but around a specific project or initiative with Data Stacks, help them, sort of, well, they launched this managed database that was serverless. So wrote up a, a really awesome technical content around that help them drive home the specific value that they saw in it and capped it off with a live stream of one of their developers who happened to already know me and about what I'd been doing in the past. And so they were super happy with it. They learned a lot about the process. They've improved it and they're keen to do another project, right? And Equinix Metal is another client just keeps coming back. What's your contact there? Is it James? At Equinix Metal? Yeah. I have a lot of contacts there. It okay. almost feel like an extended family at this point. Jacob is somebody that I've known from very early on, Jacob Smith, and he was getting me access to really big ARM servers mm-hmm. when I was basically completely hooked on Raspberry Pis. And so which which does, oh, the they do the Grow Lab sponsorship, right? No, they haven't sponsored Grow Lab, but I did do a talk for them at the at the conference. Okay, that's what it was. Got and, it. And um, Grow Lab is just to say quickly, there's now thirty official participants. Call them Grow oh. Lab technicians. So, so you get to feel a bit special. For people, people don't know there. Grow Lab. Sorry to cut you off, but just I want people to know because this is a really cool project. Can you just give like maybe like a Twitter bio of what Grow Lab is? Okay, Grow Lab is growing plants with raspberry pies and the idea is that you build a rig i've got a design that i basically i knew almost nothing about diy and woodworking that's completely different now because i've really got into it but i basically took a sheet of plywood drilled a hole in it stuck some pipe in it bought some um, elbows for it and managed to get the camera so it was right over the plants bought a seed tray plants i wanted and just started taking a picture using some software I wrote a few years ago. And then you're able to make a time-lapse of that. But you can take it even further. And that's why I have like a gazillion GitHub commits at the moment, is that I started to take the image from the camera, upload it to GitHub pages. That was getting published on my domain. People could live view how my cress or basil or, or, or tomato plants were growing. I was going to say, you were, you're, it's like you were a machine. And literally, it was a machine that was making that guy. Get well, that's... To, uh, that project was an opportunity cost. I literally had to carve out a week to build the initial version of that. And with anything that oh. you do, the prototype's always going to cost you. Right? It's a lot of learning to be done. It might cost you in that nobody wants it. I was really worried about that to begin with. And then I had the first two adopters of it who then attracted other adopters. There's a guy, Richard Gee, who actually does the commits into the repo. Now I don't do them anymore. So when people register uh, to say they're participating or update their achievement level, he merges them. And I just look at the pretty pictures afterwards. So I would love to talk more. I mean, I I feel like I've been silent on this podcast, mostly because you're just so eloquent and so good at talking about what it means to be a really successful open source developer. You mentioned how important emails were to you. You mentioned how important is your Twitter following. Before we let you go, because we are running up on time, I want to make sure people know where they can follow you online. So could you share those? Yeah, so uh, I'm very easy to find. I just look for Alex Ellis. Alex Ellis UK on Twitter. You can go to the OpenFast blog or in Latch. You'll find me very quickly. One of the things that we didn't touch on that much was that I've got basically got three self-published eBooks now, one on Go, which is all based around everyday examples that you will use at work that are based on these projects that I've created and the lessons that I've learned. CLIs, unit testing, Go routines, Prometheus metrics, instrumentation, some really hard stuff, but also a lot of the fundamentals, code examples. Serverless for everyone else gets you up and running 
with OpenFAS in Node.js, writing really practical functions again, being able to monitor them, deploy them with TLS. And it's all geared around a project that you can run for a few dollars a month on a VPS or on your laptop. And the last one on there is about K3S and Raspberry Pi. So there's definitely a lot out there where people can even lessen the support need now of the open source community because if somebody arrives and they have a specific question, you can always refer them to one of the books and help them help themselves. Love that. We will have those links in the show notes as well for those of you who would like to follow up later. And we also took a lot of quotes during this. So if you want to have particular quotes, feel free to check out those show notes or share with us if they're not there and let us know what you like best about this podcast. Alex, it was great to have you on. Thank you so much. Best of luck with OpenFAS and all of your many awesome projects. Hope to hear from you in the future. And thanks again. 